So I don't know if everyone can hear me. Thanks for coming out um, on Sunday evening. It's great to be with everyone for this session on transthyroid and amyloid cardiomyopathy. We're going to be talking about best practices for successful outcomes in patients with heart failure. Uh, I just want to thank uh, the uh, accrediting sponsor, which is the HFSA, uh, the commercial sponsor, AstraZeneca, for providing an educational grant for the symposium, and Vox Medica for providing uh, program management services. Um, as you know, successful completion of the continuing education activity includes uh, participation in the uh, post-course evaluation. Uh, to claim uh, CE credit, um, any learners must complete a session-specific evaluation. And uh, for that, the website is accessible by either the uh, HFSA ACM 2023 mobile app. Um, uh, you can use CE credit kiosk at the registration desk or the direct uh, URL. Um, to claim the credit, you've got to complete the following steps. You've got to log in by your last name and registration ID, locate the specific satellite symposium by title name, and complete the evaluation. Um, please uh, see the faculty disclosures information in the uh, handbook. Uh, representative slides are actually included um, with the handout, and uh, questions cards are located on the seat. And if you have any questions, please uh, jot them down. We'll, uh, have personnel that will come around to collect the cards throughout the program. And um, uh, please, if you could, silence all your uh, uh, electronic devices so um, we can move ahead. Um, it is uh, really uh, absolutely my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, my colleague, Dr. Ahmed Masri from uh, Portland, Oregon. He's going to be talking to us about raising awareness, screening, and uh, diagnosis in uh, ATTRCM patients with uh, clinical heart failure. So without further ado, Dr. Masri. Thank you, Dr. Marr. Um, let's see. All right. I think these are the wrong slides, but that's okay. Yeah, if we can get the slides up. And as you can see, we can't stop talking about amyloid. So thank you all for uh, coming tonight and joining us. So um, we'll go through the, these slides. You know, uh, we're trying to give you kind of a little bit of a flavor of what's been happening in this disease space, as well as give you a flavor of, of how things are looking into the future. This is rapidly evolving. I think if we meet again next year, you're going to see a different set of uh, uh, key takeaways from any talk. So those are my disclosures. Well, that's a wrong slide, too. So um, let's see if we can. Also the wrong slide. Also wrong slide. All right. Anyway, we may, maybe we don't need slides. So, so as you know, with, when we talk about cardiac amyloidosis, there are two major subtypes of cardiac amyloidosis. So we have a transthyretin amyloidosis and we have light chain amyloidosis. There are about, you know, depending on which paper you quote, there are between 27 and... Um, th so these are not the slides. If you can pull up the earlier version that we had before, we maybe manage the last version uh, would be great, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, so, um, so talking about uh, back to the amyloid situation. So uh, with cardiac amyloidosis, you can have up to 30, 35 different types of amyloid. It's very generic. It's just anything that deposits between the cells that is protein material in origin, this is amyloid. But for us, practically speaking, most of the patients have either light chain amyloidosis or transthyretin amyloidosis. We're going to focus on transthyretin amyloidosis for today's talks. Um, let's see. Do we have any slides or not yet? I can keep going, but... Uh, all right, never mind. So, um, and when we talk about, you know, how we want to diagnose these patients, I think, you know, clinical acumen here, this is one of the, probably one of the diseases that you actually cannot rely just on your imaging, on your biomarkers, on, you know, on AI maybe, and trying to find out patients. You actually need to listen to patients, talk to them, understand their trajectory over time. Orthopedic manifestations of the disease include carpal tunnel, especially when bilateral and without traumatic injury or rheumatological disorder. When you have essentially spinal stenosis, back issues, all of these things are really important because you're going to put them into context of temporality. And temporality in this disease is really, really important. And the second point is, you know, we, we, there's so many algorithms out there, but I think if you, if you don't see a lot of these patients, I think the takeaway message that you need to remember is 
you need to explain all left ventricular hypertrophy. It is structural heart disease, not any different from chest pain, not any different from having mitral regurgitation or retic. If you have structural heart disease, like left ventricular hypertrophy, you need to explain it. And that's your pathway as, uh, you know, if you're taking the care of these patients as a cardiologist, that's your pathway. So uh, we have the slides up. So we already talked about this stuff. We're not going to spend more time on it. Um, and so, uh, and it is a prevalent disease. That's why we're here tonight and talking about this. I think 10 years ago, very few people have been talking about amyloid or TTR cardiomyopathy. But since then, we've, we've figured out some, some things. So this is a study by Omar Abazidin from Mayo showing that, you know, it is an age-related condition, obviously, when you find it. So the more, the, you know, the longer you live, the more likely that you can have Transthyretin amyloidosis, but it's really interesting if you if you undergo a systematic screening strategy. Look at the difference in the numbers; they're fairly impressive. If you focus on the group who's 80 to 89 or above 90, that's essentially you know doubling, tripling, even 10 times more if you do systematic screening compared to clinical diagnosis, and that's important. The second point is that you know the more you look, the more you find. These are some earlier studies that we've had, but I think they're still seminal, and we should essentially uh, show them and talk about them. The first one was inpatient admissions for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. 13% had uh, TTR amyloidosis, uh, and uh, what's really important in that study, that half of them were women. We always say that women is extremely rare to have TTR amyloidosis. I think we're uncovering slowly that this is not necessarily true. And then another study looked at HFF patients with biopsy, uh, showing that you have essentially about 15% or so. And then finally, with aortic stenosis, uh, uh, Adam Castaño and Matt Morer did this, you know, long time ago, uh, one of the first reports to come out with showing 16% of patients referred for uh, TAVR having um, ATTR uh, amyloidosis as well. So this is the bottom line that many, many studies, I haven't included more, I stopped counting. <laughs> Two years ago, I think there are four more studies showing all the same thing. The prevalence is between 5 and 10 percent. 15 is a little bit of a stretch in aortic stenosis, I think. I think you're more closer to, to you know, 7 to 10 percent if you focus on the group that is 70 years of age or older. You know, we did this study a while ago now. Uh, it's not published yet, but it, hopefully it will be uh, sometime soon. It was last year, showing, you know, using very large claims database, which the, f the problem is that you cannot confirm any of the diagnosis. But, you know, we had very stringent criteria for evaluating patients, and we did many, many landmark analyses, you know, truncating essentially the follow-up, constituting you have to have six months before, and then, you know, amount of follow-up after showing that if you have concurrent diagnosis of uh, aortic stenosis and uh, cardiac amyloidosis, you have higher risk, essentially, of, of death and heart failure hospitalization. When we did our own studies as, a, you know, multi, it was multi-center, two-center studies, looked at patients referred for TAVR, we saw that there is no increased mortality, but there is increase in heart failure hospitalization. These were untreated patients with TTR amyloidosis. So it's really important to pick these patients. You're giving a valve that is, the valve itself is $25,000. The procedure is $75,000. If you don't treat their TTR amyloid, if they have it, we're not sure that they actually changed something or not. And so when to think about amyloid, carpal tunnel, especially bilateral, coexist and unexplained neuropathy, yes, as a cardiologist, you should ask about neuropathy. Uh, and I think it's really important as part of care. Also think about autonomic dysfunction when it's really completely out of proportion to your cardiac phenotype. Explain all uh, LVH and uh, think about using strain if you have it available for you as well. Strain is not diagnostic. I think that's where we ask too much sometimes of the echocardiogram. And so strain is a good screening and increases your specificity when you're thinking about amyloid. But you shouldn't necessarily use it solo as a, as a sole means of saying someone have amyloid or not, doesn't have amyloid. Uh, this is also from uh, Adam and Matt, uh, uh, which, you know, it's one of my favorite things ever. Um, you know, you don't need to do strain. You actually can just look at something that is found on echoes if you go back 20 years ago, which is the S wave. You're all used to E prime and A prime, which are measures of diastolic function. S wave is a measure of systolic function. It's how much your uh, basal part of the LV wall is moving in. If you had an MI there before, you can't use it. If you have a mitral valve replacement there, you can't use it. But otherwise, the majority of people, you can use it, and it performs very, very well. There are now many scores trying to look at ATTR and AS, and you know, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense to actually score things all the time with, for everything. 
I think what makes sense is just to put things into clinical context and understand that no matter how good you think you are, it's very hard to differentiate two conditions that cause somewhat close phenotype. So if you have someone with aortic stenosis and LVH, it's not going to be easy if they, have, if they fit the right clinical profile. It's not going to be easy for you to say that they have TTR or not. You just simply, if you want to try to do the right thing, I think you should simply think about it. You don't have to investigate it if you don't think it exists, but just think about it. That's where we need to go. And so this is from Maz Hanna and Brett Sperry, uh, uh, who we're lucky to have both here today. 10% um, of biopsies on carpal tunnel uh, uh, surgery showed amyloid deposits. 2% had variant TTR, 2% had cardiac disease already, and 3% were initiated on therapy. So it's a good strategy. The problem is that we don't know what to do over time. And we're learning, and you're going to see more papers downstream, but we need to figure out what we're doing over time. Because if you take 10,000 patients that have some deposits in the, in the, in the carpal tunnel, for example, release, uh, Latino synovium, how many of them are going to be positive 10 years later? How much are you going to do from screening strategy? How much money are you going to spend downstream? All these are really important questions. We talked about this before. This is really important. You know, we, we, we have somewhat of a, a suboptimal uh, uh, to, to poor history in taking care of, uh, of, of, uh, of minorities and uh, patients of, uh, of color. And you know, this, is a, this is really a chance to try and correct this, at least in the amyloid space, where we have significant burden of V122i, which is a very specific mutation that happens of patients of Western African ancestry and Afro-Caribbeans. And so uh, what happens is you have this single amino acid change that leads to destabilization of TTR. It's age-related, so don't think about it in someone who's 20-year-old. We actually do see this now, which is the opposite of what we want. We see 20-year-olds coming because they have V122i from 23andMe, and they have some numbness somewhere. They're thinking they have amyloid. That's not necessarily true. Uh, there are rare cases of homozygous disease that can present early, but those are rare. The more common ones are heterozygous disease. And this is a study that was done by one of our fellows, Pranav Chandrasekhar, tried to put everything together because the literature is extremely confusing. But we're not going to go through it, but I just want to show the bottom line. You have many, many, many patients in your communities who have heart failure and have V122i ATTR amyloidosis. So next time you see a, a, a black patient who essentially uh, has heart failure or who essentially is struggling with symptoms, think about this you know, in the age-appropriate group. And then this is a reminder also from uh, uh, Maz Hanna that uh, a fourth of the patients don't have, actually, uh, of black patients don't have V122i. So if, you know, we thought initially we we're going to be smart, we can actually just use a strategy of V122i screening in these patients. No. Just like white people, they can get wild-type TTR. So the strategy should, again, go back to clinical evaluation, clinical acumen, and then TTR gene sequencing. And this is why this is important. Whatever study you like to cite and look at, the mortality of patients, uh, of black patients, is much higher than the rest. And so you have to keep an eye on that as well, you know, both men and women. And so why do we need to recognize TTR, um, ATTR amyloidosis early? Look at this in ATTR Act, which is... Two months ago, it was the only randomized trial. Now we have two phase three randomized clinical trials for amyloidosis. But look at NYHA class three in terms of CV hospitalization, for example. You know, it, it's very clear to us that you need to find these patients earlier so that you can intervene early and make them live longer and have less heart failure hospitalizations. Uh, this is uh, attribute CM, which is acromidus, uh, another trial that uh, showed us that uh, was positive and showed there is uh, somewhat of a, of, a, of a similar magnitude in terms of relative risk reduction. Uh, the absolute risk difference was 6.4. Mortality is much less. So if you think about uh, the placebo arm in attract, it was 50% mortality at 33 months. Here you have essentially 25% mortality at 30 months. So you know either we're great at taking care of patients or something is changing. And it's a combination of the above, increased awareness, early recognition, less time from diagnosis to putting someone on therapy, as well as more importantly, we actually are educating the community to look for this and try to recognize that this is a treatable disease as a subtype of heart failure and you should seek it out. Um, this is, this is a, a study that we have done many here in the audience, uh, uh, as well as the panel, our participants. We looked at the real-world performance of tefamidus, and we, sh we essentially are show that you know, it, it's, it, it's somewhat you know, overlapping with how tefamidus was, was doing in the trial there. 
we're not, you know, just because of time and we started late, we're not going to go through the details. But what we wanted to get at is, you know, in clinical trials, the typical takeaway is that people will do better in trials than they do in real life because it's a controlled setting, all that stuff. Here we show that at least based on our experience, uh, uh, patients are doing either as good as they did in the trial or potentially better if we continue to follow them up over time. Um, just a quick reference, there, there is a whole other world out there outside of cardiology, believe it or not. And we have here four trials for polyneuropathy associated with ATTR amyloidosis. Uh, all four trials show the same thing. You have stability of your neuropathy score if you, if you silence TTR production from the liver. Something we didn't talk about quickly, there are two strategies right now, silencing and stabilizing. Stabilizing, you bind the TTR tetramer and keep it from falling apart. Silencing, you go to the liver selectively and try to shut down the production of TTR, transthyretin amyloid by, at, or transthyretin protein by 80% or so right now. There is gene editing coming down the pike. There is anti-amyloid therapy coming down the pike, which removes amyloid from, from the tissues. But this, these are not established therapies as of yet. Only stabilization and silencing is established commercially at this point in time. This is data we showed yesterday. Even if you look at, uh, at, at, at cardio, uh, even if you look at the cardiac phenotype within these polyneuropathy trials, this is just an example of neurotransform showing stability of the phenotype. So while we don't have a cardiac specific trial with mortality so far using silencing approach, we actually have one trial uh, uh, of cardiomyopathy using six minute walk test, which is Apollo B, uh, Dr. Moore presented before and other sub studies from it. And then we have a couple of other of these neuropathy trials that had enrolled patients with both neuropathy and cardiomyopathy. And so I'm gonna speed up just one more minute uh, for the sake of time. You have many, many tools of diagnosing patients. The bottom line is always do free light chain in the serum. You don't need the urine. Free light chains in the serum. You do immunofixation of the serum or immunotyping of the serum and then the urine. So if you don't have urine, it's okay. Go with the free light chains and the serum as well as the immunofixation serum and then you can get that later on you know, if you feel the need for it. That combined with bone scintigraphy, PYP, HMDP or HDP are available in the United States, DPD available outside of the United States. Don't forget there is something called endomyocardial biopsy. We thought we're gonna just uh, get away with that. I think we still need it five to 10% of the time. And most of the cases that become case reports and become case presentation in conferences are because the cardiologists did not biopsy the heart. So keep that in mind. We have so many imaging tools the bottom line is that you have to think about the disease to get to these imaging tools. And you need to be able to look at your pictures when you acquire them. If you are not familiar with MRI, get a friend who you like and they like you and you can text them the pictures, for example, because there is extremely uh, you know, variability in the, read, in the readouts in the community for these things, as well as actually academic centers. And then, um, you know, technetium pyrophosphate can be very difficult. This is spec CT. You can say if it's positive or negative. Nobody can tell you. You know, we did HMDP because we thought we were smarter by doing HMDP. I thought it was positive, but that's after staring at it for an hour. Somebody else essentially thought it's negative and reported it as negative. I was convinced the patient had amyloidosis, so I biopsied him and it was positive. But this is the, these are the challenges that you see. Clinical evaluation is the most important part, I think, of this disease so far. And then, you know, uh, 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 Dia Smiley and Matt Moore also showed that a patient who was biopsy-proven disease, negative PYP, was positive on this new tracer called uh, ATO1 evazumatide. Uh, and then later reported a study of 10 patients who were negative on PYP that were positive on that. So PYP is not the end of it. Don't, if you have clinical suspicion, don't stop at PYP. And then, you know, we're not going to go through this, but this is a study that we showed recently about, you know, different organ involvement using novel tracers and its relationship to ECV and whatnot. But I'll, I'll stop here and conclude that ATTR-CM is common and is evolving rapidly. It's a treatable cause of heart failure, specific cause that you can treat. This is not very common in heart failure in general. Early diagnosis is paramount, avoid misdiagnosis. Natural history of the disease is evolving, and there are new imaging agents, hopefully, will refine our diagnostic approach. Thank you. Thanks, that was fantastic. Um, 
So I'm going to be uh, talking to you about um, current and emerging therapies and some best practices. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, so just in general, the management of these patients, nicely highlighted by European society guidelines. Uh, um, atrial fibrillation is very common. We anticoagulate these patients irrespective of their CHADS VAS score. Um, we heard about aortic stenosis. If you're going to fix it, please do a TAV or try not to put these patients under a pump run. Um, conduction disease is quite common. There's some belief that these patients actually need a biventricular pacemaker, and there's uh, studies potentially underway. It's rare that these patients need actually an ICD because they rarely pass away from a malignant ventricular arrhythmia. And most of us spend a lot of time in the bottom uh, corner there in the heart failure realm trying to control uh, volume status and using diuretics, um, and so we'll touch a little bit about that. Um, this is the typical phenotype you can see. Here's a patient who has actually no ventricular chamber, right? The ventricular capacitance is gone. The atrium are twice as big. And this is a patient who develops what we call in the physiological world progressive diastolic dysfunction. Their EDPVR, or capacitance, shifts upward and to the left. The end diastolic volume goes down. The stroke volume goes down. If your stroke volume goes down, so does your cardiac output and hence your blood pressure. And so these are patients who often need medicines removed or deprescribed at a certain point in time. Um, these are data from our group looking at beta blockers um, uh, in uh, these patients and ACE inhibitors, long-term studies, not a large group of patients, pretty sick at the time with advanced cardiac amyloid, and they did not have a mortality benefit. Surprisingly, in this more advanced group of patients who were typically treated with high doses of carvedilol when we first saw them, when we deprescribed or removed the beta blocker, you can see there was a greater than 50% reduction in mortality. So we're removing beta blockers from people who are pretty sick, and they're actually living longer, at least when we uh, saw this. Um, these data are a little bit, I think, now in the controversial world, so I want to tell you that uh, beta blockers are always bad. Um, the NAC has recently published data in over 2,300 individuals in which they showed, similar to us, that ACE inhibitors and ARBs have no mortality benefit. Beta blockers overall had no benefit, but low-dose beta blockers, prosopolol, 2.5 milligrams or less, you know, so pretty low <laughs> dose, was associated in those with an EF under 40 percent with a reduction in mortality. So uh, something to be considered about completely deprescribing beta blockers. Uh, Brett has nicely shown um, in the top cat study that those who were given uh, uh, aldosterone antagonists, uh, aldactone or spironolactone, had a similar clinical benefit when they had a phenotype that was consistent with amyloid. And the NAC paper showed that across all patients with a TTR amyloid, MRAs were rarely deprescribed, were well tolerated, and were associated, irrespective of ejection fraction, with a 23% reduction in mortality. These are non randomized data, propensity matched but it's the best we have at this point in time. We know in these patients, as they progress, they develop a cardiorenal syndrome. Their CVP goes up, their stroke volume goes down, their blood pressure declines, they got worsening renal dysfunction, and we tend to escalate diuretics. These are data from our group showing that when you index the dose of diuretic that they're receiving and you add it to various biomarker prognostic scores, it's quite um, predictive of events. Here you can see worsening survival with increased diuretics. So you'd imagine with the emergence of SGLT2s, we may have a real important therapeutic role to play in these particular patients, but there's not a lot of data. These are data that we are trying to get uh, published at this point, so these are hot off the press and under review. These are 87 patients in our cardiac amyloid program. You can see 80 years of age, predominantly male, all who are on background stabilizer therapy or silencer-based treatments. Um, elevated NT pro BNPs, and we use both uh, SGLT2s that are typically on the market at this point. This is what happens to patients when they start this therapy. You can see uh, pre and then at baseline. Um, what happens with their uh, diuretic dose is their median dose of Lasix was 40 milligrams. It goes down by about 8 or milligrams or 25 percent. Their uh, weight also tends to decline o over time, uh, you can see, and their EGFR drops like we saw in the HEFPEF trials, but then begins to recover and is no longer clinically significant. These are not associated with big changes. The use of these agents, at least at six months' time, with the biomarker changes we're showing here, NT, pro BNP, troponin, um, hemoglobin A1C, but they markedly reduce uric acid, as we've seen in other populations. It looks like these are agents that, as I think, are combating the diuretic resistance we see in this particular cohort. And so up front, many of us, I think, are now using MRAs and SGLT2s in patients with uh, TTR amyloid. 
as you heard, this field has kind of undergone a revolution. Um, uh, it's a, many different trials, and it's kind of unbelievable. Every one we do seems to be positive, so let's hope we keep it up. Um, <laughs> you know, there was the tefaminous polyneuropathy trial, people remember, in 2011 that led to its approval for neuropathy in Europe. We had the ATTR ACK results, and then we have various other trials that are um, either completed or soon to be completed or, um, uh, you know, and have been shown to be um, positive, and so I'll review some of that data. Um, the biology of this disease I think many people are familiar with, but just to review, TTR is a tetrameric protein made on chromosome 18 in hepatocytes, uh, also produced in the choroid plexus and the retinal epithelium, but a majority produced in the liver. The tetramer in the setting of aging or mutations uh, can dissociate into monomers that can form amyloid fibrils. So you can silence or knock down the protein with either antisense or small interfering RNA or maybe CRISPR. It certainly knocks it down, but we don't know about clinical benefits. You can stabilize the protein with tefamidus, uh, diflunosol off-label and non-steroidal, and now we know acaromatous is effective. And then there's this very exciting arena of anti-amyloid therapies that we're moving into. These are the recent ACC consensus pathway document that was drafted by colleagues, um, and it basically highlights that the only available therapy uh, for TTR is um, uh, tefamidus currently and that um, for AL amyloid, we recommend collaboration with a neurologist and uh, a hematologist, excuse me, and often use of a daratubumab up front. Tefaminus, as we know, is a class of agent uh, developed by Jeff Kelly. It fits in the dimer-dimer interface you can see here, um, as the cartoon shows, stabilizing TTR, and led to rather dramatic and meaningful reductions in morbidity and mortality in patients with a number needed to treat of about seven and a half patients to prevent one death over 30 months and an NNT of about four to prevent one hospitalization. Um, the drug doesn't make people usually on average feel any better. At best, it may stabilize the condition or slow the progression. And these are the six minute hall walk and KCCQ data from the original ATTRACT trial. This all leads to what we heard before, which is one of the key things in this field is to en engage providers like yourself, think amyloid, and try to identify patients as early as possible. These are relative risk reductions. There are wide confidence intervals related to the small ends, but as you can see in ATTR Act, we had only 37 patients out of 441, less than 10%, who were NYHA class one, but a relative risk reduction in mortality of 64%, 39% for class two, and only 16% for class three. So, you know, these are the last ESC, um, if you will, um, uh, guidelines. I've adjusted them because we now have, they're not updated. Vitruceran is approved for uh, uh, polyneuropathy variant patients with or without cardiomyopathy. Most of us will use a stabilizer um, up front for pure cardiomyopathy patients. That's what's approved for, and we wait data and maybe approval for uh, several other agents. Um, so we'll review some of the emerging data. There's the acaromatous data that um, was widely successful, and I'll show you patisseran, a small interfering RNA in a one-year short-term pilot trial, uh, not a uh, phase three trial, met its primary endpoint and its key secondary. Um, and then we have a vitruceran um, uh, in Helios B, a plenitercin in cardiotransform, which is, wow, the largest trial we've ever conducted, more than 1,400 patients enrolled with really meaningful endpoints being assessed. And then we have the CRISPR therapies that are um, planning to move, we believe, into phase three next year. So Attribute enrolled uh, 421 patients in the active arm and 211 in the placebo. It was a two to one matching, very similar to ATTRACT with certain differences, um, but a pretty um, uh, moderately affected population, predominantly men, NT-Pro BNPs of about 2,000, 300, where they were 3,000 in a tract, and you can see the rest of the variables there, with some concomitant tefaminous use in this trial because after 12 months of therapy, people could drop in on tefaminous. Um, these are the comparisons between the two trials. Uh, patients are getting older, as you can see. We're not finding a lot more women, um, but uh, we're doing a worse job at identifying minority patients to engage in clinical trials and variant patients. And I think that's disappointing and we need to focus our efforts. These patients in attribute are less ill, which you can see class three heart failure going from 32% to 17%. So we're identifying people earlier, and therefore I think you can expect changes in the phenotype and the effect of therapies. 
So attribute on a hierarchical rank sum like we used in uh, ATTR ACT, this was a four port hierarchy, one on the um, uh, overall endpoint with a win ratio of 1.77 and uh, highly statistically significant. 58% of the wins were due to the first two endpoints, mortality and or um, morbidity in CV hospitalizations. Um, these are some other data that were presented by uh, Julian at ESC. You can see NT Pro BNP rising much more rapidly in the placebo arm than those on uh, Acheromatous. Six minute hall walk, finally, by the end of the trial, was their part A endpoint that they didn't meet, showing a, a divergence, but it took a long time. KCCQ diverging, but slower than in the sick patients we saw in a tract. And uh, with these agents, basically, serum TTR rises, so it's a nice blood test to show a patient that there's target engagement and the drug is working, though we don't know that that's at all prognostic beyond the biomarkers. The hypothesis we all know by hope by behind small interfering RNA, antisense, and CRISPR is shown here. You're making a protein that becomes unstable, deposits in the organ, and causes the phenotype, and what you're trying to do is reduce the unstable circulating uh, tetramer and monomers, prevent organ deposition, and hopefully stabilize or maybe even reverse the phenotype that we haven't really seen that that much with uh, these agents. The Apollo B trial, which we reported last year in Heidelberg, and we presented 24-month data here at this meeting, um, was a phase three study, a randomized international double-blind comparing patisseran every three weeks to placebo. Up to 30% of the patients could be on background to famitis, and the primary endpoint to this trial, which was only 12 months done during COVID, was um, six-minute hall walk, and the secondary pre-specified was KCCQ. Um, the trial met its primary endpoint. You can see here in kind of the purple color the placebo group with a decline in their six-minute hall walk and the patisseran group staying relatively stable. And while it was statistically different, I would just say the clinical effect is, you know, less than impressive and only 15 meters. Having said all that, if this were to continue at two years and three years in the same course, you'd certainly get some pretty meaningful effects. Similarly, the KCCQ um, was very stable in those patients on active therapy or patisseran and declined in those on placebo with, again, a statistically significant difference and, I think, a debatable clinically significant difference. Probably most impressive to me was that at 12 months, the echoes look a lot better in these particular patients, um, uh, particularly uh, stroke volume and end diastolic volume and cardiac output, and that's not something we saw in um, uh, other uh, large-scale clinical trials even after 30 months. So it looks like these drugs are a little bit more active earlier. Then there's CRISPR, single IV infusion, basically a lipid nanoparticle to deliver this to the hepatocyte inside the lipid nanoparticle is the TTR-specific guide in the CRISPR-Cas base 9 system. Single infusion stops your production of TTR permanently and leads to, in the published data, a pretty meaningful knockdown of serum TTR that's greater than 90 percent. Uh, very exciting um, and uh, something I think that needs to be uh, certainly thought of and pursued. And then finally, the real, I think, mind blow to me, when I was at the ESC meeting when uh, Pablo Garcia presented and the published paper was published in the England journal is anti-amyloid therapies, and these really have taken hold. There are two for AL, and then there is two for TTR and one that's for all forms. Uh, um, these are agents that are moving into um, phase three clinical trials um, uh, very, very rapidly. Um, Alexion is planning a phase three trial early next year or later this year. Um, one agent is, uh, used to be called PRX04 by Prothena, now it's Novo Nordis's compound. Again, all of these are usually mon humanized monoclonal antibodies. They find a particular epitope on TTR when it's misfolded that's not present on the intact tetramer, and through antibody-mediated phagocytosis, you can uh, activate macrophages and lead to removal of amyloid from the affected organ. Um, and these are the data that I was mentioning. Um, here you can see with scintigraphy, at four months only, there's a decline in 12 months, though I'm not sure what changes in scintigraphy mean, and maybe in discussions we can talk about that, but the extracellular changes on MRI were quite impressive over a very brief period of time, and these are absolute changes of upwards of 15 or 20 points, you know, in ECV. So you went from 45 to, like, back to 30. Um, so I would just say that, um, you know, we are indebted to our basic science colleagues, uh, our people from the pharmaceutical industry who we tend to pick on, and I certainly do for the cost of drugs, but without them, we wouldn't be in this enviable position 
where I think because we now understand the basic mechanisms underlying this disease, we've developed several therapies that are effective in the clinic. And um, there's likely to be many more therapies. And I think we're all going to be in this very enviable position of having several therapies um, and that we'll have to try to choose amongst them in a lack of really good data and sometimes be costly, but it's a good position for our patients to be in. So I thank you for your time and attention. Um, and it really gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Brett Sperry. He's going to give us some case presentations on best practices for recognizing, diagnosing, and managing um, patients with uh, cardiomyopathy due to amyloid and heart failure. Thanks. No problem. Thanks, everyone. Um, so everyone's done with dinner, and we're going to fight the postprandial food coma with some, <laughs> with some cases here. Um, but I tried to pick some good cases. Maybe we can have some discussion about them. Um, you know, and, and I tried to pick cases uh, that were recent, although the third case I'd, I just added earlier today, and it's someone that I'd, I'd seen for a long time. So um, again, I'm at St. Luke's Mid-America in Kansas City, and here are my disclosures. So this is the first case. This is a 61-year-old black gentleman who was admitted for heart failure. He came in with 15 pounds of volume overload. His NC pro BNP and troponin were a little bit elevated. Um, he did not have carpal tunnel, bicep tendon rupture, or spinal stenosis. He did have some tingling in his feet, none in his hands. He had some constipation on review of systems. He had 12 siblings, no family history of heart failure in parents or siblings. And so, I mean, obviously we're all thinking amyloid here because we're in an amyloid session, but this is a type of presentation that you see very commonly. Um, and as Dr. Masri said, you know, you really need to think about amyloid. It has to be on the, 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 the forefront of your brain in order to actually make the diagnosis in some of these patients. So uh, you had the echo, and these, these images are moving here, but you can see how thick the LV walls are uh, and all the different views here. Um, oftentimes, this gets thought of as hypertensive heart disease or renal failure, uh, but certainly in this, this, uh, this race, in this age, with this amount of LVH, you really need to think about amyloid and, and take the next step. So here uh, are his initial, or his, his workup, basically. He had a kappa lambda. Um, kappa was 9.4. Lambda was 40.9. So lambda was only a little bit elevated uh, in this assay. The kappa was normal. The ratio was slightly abnormal. And the way ours comes back is we, we get our kappa lambda back quickly, and then we get the immunofixation back a few days later. So um, immunofixations did end up showing a lambda uh, IgG in the urine and in the serum, and he had a PYP scan that was done. Uh, I think the PYP scan came back first uh, of all these things. It was done as an inpatient. And so I'm showing you three images here. So the top image is, uh, and this is spec, this is spec CT. So the top image uh, are the non-attenuation correction images. The middle were the uh, attenuation correction images. Not attenuation cor correction, but I kind of scaled it up to be able to s try to see anything that I could in the myocardium. And then the attenuation correction images uh, on the bottom, I scaled up and also, you know, so this is, this is a difficult one. I would say that I think I do see the heart there, but it's very faint. You know, if you look in the right short axis, you kind of see a little things that look like circles in all the images, but it's very, very faint and certainly would not uh, hang your hat on this as far as a, uh, uh, very positive study. So we call this kind of a grade one study. Uh, and given the abnormal kappa and lambda, you know, we went on to, um, uh, actually he got, he got a, a cardiac MRI here, and I think this was done afterwards, but I just put it in here just so we see, and I know Dr. Masri is our, our MRI expert here, but uh, the ejection fraction was 32%. The T1 time was elevated. The ECV was elevated, and you see the the LGE images on, on the right there showing uh, pretty diffuse late gadolinium enhancement. So see, clearly something is going on here um, in the myocardium. It, it, it definitely looks and smells like amyloid, but how do you figure out what, what type of amyloid it is? So, um, you know, I think, I think we all sort of know where we're going here. Uh, you know, if you're not sure what's going on, you need to get the actual tissue. So this guy went for a heart biopsy and actually had AL amyloid. Um, 
uh, when, you know, when I first saw him and I saw his echo, I thought he probably would have a TTR given his race and his, <clears throat> his age, uh, but that's why you go through the pathway and that's why you try to, try to get to the bottom of things. His bone marrow showed 20% plasma cells, Congo red negative. He had this T1114 uh, translocation here. So we started him on, there's sort of the second part of this case, um, maybe for the first part. Any, any comments from you guys on this as far as uh, differentiating between AL and ATTR and when to go for biopsy? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, you should know 70% of patients with light chain amyloid have a lambda clone. So, you know, even if uh, everything looks normal to you, but your kappa is not higher than your lambda, you should, you should definitely be, you know, scrupulous about looking at that. There are these, you know, overcalls of kappa lambda abnormalities because of renal insufficiency. But I would urge you all to be very, very suspicious when your lambda is even in a normal range, but it's higher than your kappa. In this case, he also had a, a S pi and a U pi that were positive. So that should really, you know, I, I, you know obviously he, you can get all these things, as the Europeans say, simultaneously, which is perfectly fine. But 25% of patients who have AL amyloid will have a false positive, if you will, PYP scan. So the algorithm is you have to exclude light chains and then use the PYP. Once you have a positive light chain, you're done with the PYP scan. You can't use it to distinguish which type you have, and you have to go on to an endomyocardial biopsy. Um, we used to biopsy everyone prior to 2000 in our data set. It's like several hundred, you know, five, six hundred, everyone before 2013. And now we biopsy about still 18% of patients. So it's, if you're not biopsying everyone in your center uh, at all, and then you're doing something probably incorrect, right? Um, you do need to, I think, have access to some endomyocardial biopsy. The MRI? You do MRI for the 82%? Uh, there, there's no role, in my opinion, for MRI in distinguishing the type of amyloid. So mm. you can do MRI to confirm that there's a phenotype there, but it's not going to tell you whether they have AL or TTR. There's no... Oh, we, with lambda positive, you do MRI? Well, you can do an MRI if you want, but in the diagnostic workup, I guess I'm trying to say, is to figure out which type of amyloid he has. Bef before we got to the biopsy, we should be thinking that this gentleman needs a biopsy, is my point. You need, you need tissue somehow. For, to get a diagnosis of AL, you need tissue somehow. So, uh, you, you need, uh, so you're either going to need Congo red positive on a, a fat pad biopsy or a bone marrow biopsy or, or the endomyocardium. But I think this is a great example of when you should be careful. If everything is playing out right, 50-year-old, young, everything is playing for AL, you can use imaging for cardiac involvement if your bone marrow looks, you know, consistent. But in someone for high risk for TTR at the same time, you probably should not only use your bone marrow as the reason to call them to have AL. You should probably go to endomyocardial biopsy. Demographics. There are very few patients who have both, but as we begin to take care of more and more people, I don't want to confuse things, we are definitely seeing patients, particularly people who are males over the age of, say, 75, who can have both diseases. That's, that's pretty unusual. Um, you know, having seen 1,000 patients with cardiac amyloid, there's less than five that I've seen with that, so I don't think that's the main message, but there are people who could have both. The, the, the main takeaway here is, you know, your light chains are abnormal. You need tissue to figure it out. You can't rely on PYP scanning. It should be taken out of your armamentarium for the diagnostic workup. That's not the right role for PYP scanning. It's, um, uh, you know, just it's going to lead to a lot of consternation and false diagnoses. You know, if you get it, it's okay. But, you know, like, don't be staring at it. Think to yourself, I need to move on to get a biopsy to figure out what type of amyloid this is because I need to treat the patient appropriately. I mean, ultimately, in this case, if you call it grade 0, 1, or 2, you still need a biopsy <laughs> of the heart. So, um, so just to kind of finish up this case, this gentleman was started on therapy. He tolerated it very well for a year without any recurrent heart failure. I saw him in the office for abdominal fullness and leg swelling. Uh, and his EKG looked like this. You know, oftentimes uh, these patients have very low P wave voltages and, and you, you, uh, it's hard to tell what they have, but uh, we thought this guy had atrial flutter. Um, you know, so we, uh, the point of putting this part in here is just to kind of speak to the management of atrial arrhythmias in these types of patients. And we at least are really aggressive about this because this seems to be uh, in a lot of patients, it seems to be a real, real turning point in their history. I mean, we just transplanted a guy a month ago who was, was, hold, was very sick, but was like holding on, holding on until he went into AFib, and he had a clot in his appendage, and we could not get him out of AFib, and he was just done. He would just, just could, not, could not function anymore. So this gentleman 
uh, had a lot of right-sided heart failure symptoms. He had a five-liter paracentesis. We cardioverted him. Um, and since we did not put him on antiarrhythmic therapy, actually, uh, and I just saw him a month ago, and he's, uh, he's still fine now. I mean, he's lifting weights, and uh, he, he's doing really well. And his kappa and lambda are, are low here. They reversed the ratio of the kappa lambda, which is always good. It's hard to know how aggressive to treat these people that start with a very low lambda level, you know, um, a very low affected light chain level. He, he's been um, treated now on daratumumab monotherapy and, uh, and doing well. Our plan was to treat him for two years with this and then do, you know, repeat his bone marrow and kind of go from there. But did his EF drop when he went into... Um, uh, it did, yes. Yeah. yeah, and then recovered afterwards. Yeah, that's, I mean, one of the differentials, I think, of people who drop their ejection fraction acutely with this disease, which doesn't always happen, is, you know, an atrial arrhythmia. Um, uh, whether that be the loss of atrial kick or more often, you know, the faster ventricular response. And then the other thing that we've learned, which I would encourage to pursue very hard, we don't know how to fix, is there's a lot of microvascular disease in these patients, uh, probably from amyloid deposition. That's another reason why people tend to, in the setting of an atrial arrhythmia, drop their ejection fraction, which is a very bad sign. <laughs> Uh, the second case here, the, these last two cases are shorter. Oh, go yeah. ahead. So, so I'm uh, not an amyloid clinic, but I also heard the industry said we all about too much risk for that. And although I don't like insurance companies telling me what to do, I don't know what risk is. And although I don't like insurance companies telling me what to do, this is an argument for saying you should rule out AL first, right? And then if it's positive or you're suspicious, then you should go do a PET scan. Right? And, and when I read my too much risk scans, I also put really big letters. Yeah, I think yeah. you're, I, I mean, I help, many of us here help write the guidelines. It's a little bit discordant. I don't have, I mean, I think it's very imperative for everyone to know that, you know, the first and best test to order for someone with suspected amyloid, no matter what's going on, is a free light chain assay, right? That's what you need to do. So when someone calls me and says their PYP scans, I'm like, what's their light chain assay? And they're like, I didn't do it. I'm like, do it, you know? And in places where people are allowed, including my center, you know, not in the amyloid program, but clinical, we have a, a rate of only 40%, we publish, 44% of people ordering the light chains. The Cleveland Clinic, Maz, I don't know if he's here, has put in an order set. You can't order a PYP in their system without getting the light chains. It automatically pops up. So I completely agree with you. Um, there's some expedition. Um, I don't have a problem with people doing both on the same day, but I don't have a problem with an insurance company saying, sorry, you know, you can't order X because, you know, you didn't do Y first, and, and that may be helpful. Um, we definitely have to get that message out to everybody. And I see errors on both sides of this, right? I see people who just order light chains, right. and then they end there, right? And then there's people who just order PYPs, and then they, they end there. So the key is really that, uh, that this is a, there, there are really two diseases here that we're worried about, uh, and you need to really evaluate um, uh, if, if the light chains are normal, you know, you can't just end there. There's another type of disease here that you need to, to evaluate. All right, so the second case, this is a 93-year-old gentleman, permanent atrial fibrillation, CKD, stage 3, came in uh, with a fall and with heart failure. Uh, we have this hospital in your home program where the patient can then uh, go in their home and we can bring the hospital to them. Uh, so he went into that program. His BNP was elevated. His troponin was elevated. Uh, and these improved with some diuresis. Here's his echo. Uh, we don't have to belabor this, but, uh, you know, clearly uh, abnormal here. Um, you know, the, he, he had increased wall thickness measurements. So the, the point here that I'll make on the echo is uh, for the echo readers in the audience, I, I think getting a little clinical with the echo is the echo read is helpful, you know, pointing people towards the diagnosis that they need to make here. Uh, with the amount of LVH. Here's his PYP images. Uh, he had a free uh, kappa that was uh, mildly elevated and a free lambda that was kind of borderline, but the ratio is okay given his CKD. And there are ratios uh, with respect to CKD where you're going to have an a, a increase in the, the ratio and an increase in the kappa relative to the lambda, which is still okay. So, um, and he had negative immunofixations. So, um, you know, this guy, 
Uh, he's uh, uh, NAC stage two. He's Columbia stage three. He was on torsamide 60 twice a day, NYHA class three. He's 93. He has a recent fall, walks with a walker. Um, you know, uh, genetic testing and prescriptions. What do we think about this? I, I tell you, I, I did uh, order genetic, I did approach genetic testing with him, and uh, his, his family members kind of gave me a strange look about doing this, but uh, at least my view is that, um, you know, and, and realistically, I think people who are in the 90s are not going to have, not going to have um, hereditary, but. Um, I think Martha Grogan or someone says that uh, they, the patient may be old, but their family members are not old, and genetic testing is really f free at this point, so low barrier to get them tested. And then, uh, and then do you prescribe treatment for, for a patient like this? Who's, how do you deal with patients who are kind of outside the trial, trial data? It's not easy. I mean, I think you have to have a conversation with the patient. In my experience, no one doesn't want the therapy. It's not toxic. Um, I can recall when we did the rollover for early access, we had 148 people enrolled within like six months for Tefaminus. We had people lining up outside, and there was only one person. And I explained to him, you're not going to feel any better, um, but it may make things slow down. And uh, he said, no thanks. But most people, no offense in America, don't say no. Um, I think I made this statement a few days ago. I started a 103-year-old lady um, on Tefaminus. Um, uh, people criticize me, but she came to clinic. I don't know why in clinic they give the patient the name and the room they need to go to, and they find. And she came to the room and she said um, to me, "My name is Helene, not Helen." They left off an E, so she's pretty functional at 103 years of age that she could see the piece of paper, and you know, um, so. No, she's not going to get better, but it may slow what. That's true, and that's what. That's a good question. That's what you have to, you're completely right, I think. You think you have to counsel the patient about the reality of what you're offering them and then let them make a decision in concert with everyone. I'm not pushing. If she said no, it would be perfectly fine by me. Um. Yeah. <laughs> It actually, the class three patients, it took uh, five years almost, uh, the papers, the data is published in long-term extension. There's actually a pretty statistically significant even survival benefit, but you have to wait a long time. But to your excellent point, you have to be able to live that long. So, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I agree with you in that regard. Yeah. Cleveland Clinic had a, had a um, retrospective observational study in patients above 90 and uh, you know, some people benefit, benefit, and they, they stay, you know. And then the th second thing to remember from a tract is that it's not just the mortality. If you look at heart failure hospitalization, granted not class 3 necessarily, but six-minute walk test, KCCQ, whatnot, quality of life, it, it's earlier than one and a half years, much earlier within the first year. And so uh, just individualized, I think, at this point in time. And just while well, we have a sec, because this is relevant, someone asked a question. What's the expected increase in lifespan with uh, stabilizers? My experience is it literally has doubled people's survival. So we had people who were basically you know, dead at two and a half or three years, and now people are living at least five, if not seven years on average. So you know, these are you know, challenging and too expensive therapies uh, in that regard, not toxic. But um, they're not talking about an extra week or two of life. We're talking about pretty long periods of time. I took out the slide. There actually was a slide on this. It's published. You can look it up. Uh, 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 Rosenbaum, if she was to Rosenbaum uh, uh, in a tract. Uh, we looked at uh, Markov modeling and looked at that. And you can see for NYHA class 1 and 2, it's very different from 3. So you can take a look at that. All right, I'll do, do one more here. Uh, this is very quick. So uh, this is a 60-year-old black gentleman uh, initially diagnosed with hypertensive heart disease, came into the hospital with AFib and RVR. There was a suspicion for amyloid. His PYP was positive. Testing for plasma cell disorder was negative, E122I on genetic testing. Uh, this was in, uh, before Tefaminus was available, so he was started on all the things, green tea <laughs> extract, turmeric, doxycycline, diflunazole. Um, Tefamis was approved, but there were issues getting it uh, in, in the first several months, and that's when I saw him. Uh, he decided to stay on the above therapy. He was feeling really no, minimal to no symptoms, very active guy, former police officer. Uh, he eventually transitioned to Tefamis when he became more hypertensive, probably related to the diflunazole, and more aware of some numbness in his fingers and his toes. 
And so, um, you know, what do you what do you think about this uh, type of case? You know, he has numbness in his fingers and toes. He has V122I. Do we refer someone like this to neurology? Uh, do we refer everyone with hereditary to, neuro to neurology no matter what? Um, uh, does V122I have polyneuropathy associated with it? And, and what are the thoughts there? I think the challenge, so the first question is yes. I think everybody with, um, you know, variant disease that is not V122I necessarily should go to neurology. For your V122Is who only have cardiac symptoms, nothing else whatsoever, I think there are way too many of them to line up at the neurologist's office given their very, very long wait time. So you might just like, you know, use some discretion there. But I think honestly, every, everybody who has a potentially neuropathic mutation should get, you know, annual or once every, you know, year and a half or so, you know, visit to the neurologist's office. In terms of uh, does V122I have polyneuropathy? You know, everybody has seen patients with neuropathy with V122I, but the challenge is that, you know, it's hard to prove causality there. And, you know, uh, sometimes you have idiopathic neuropathy, you have to assume that it's related to transthyretin, but the reality is when you're dealing with patients above the age of 70, it's, it's very hard to, 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 to say for a fact that this is related. Um, you know, but I think we're at a point in time where we have to give the benefit of the doubt to the patient and be on the patient's side, and if you can't find any other reasons for someone to having polyneuropathy, you might want to treat them as such. Yeah, right. Clinical experiences, complaints in the hands are often due to just carpal tunnel and localized disease. Things in the feet are usually not, and so toes bother me. Um, many of the patients who have you know, a neuropathy often have autonomic dysfunction, and so we've gotten to use a compass screening questionnaire, and we tend to identify a cohort of people who you know, might, to your point, might benefit from referral to a, you know, a neurologist. Depends how old they are. So, you know, if they're 20, I'm not seeing them again for, you know, 30 years probably because, you know, men don't develop the disease uh, till at least usually 50. Women over 60, it's the, when it penetrates, it's an age-dependent penetrance. We think penetrance is... Um, probably been underreported in the literature. I can tell you there's a famous paper in the New England Journal that said echocardiographic penetrance is 8%. We have a screening study where by PYP it's, you know, 40%. And I bet by these PET agents it's going to be 80%, right? I mean, I think the disease does show up. And um, there's no way it can't show up because every large study epidemiologically we published suggests that it's an independent risk factor for heart failure mortality. So even if your echo or your PYP isn't showing it, something's going on that's causing these people to, you know, exit the world more frequently. So I think it's much more penetrant, we think. We have no idea how often to screen them, but I would say, you know, more frequently, the closer they get to an age of onset, you know, in general, I would say, you know, every three to five years is reasonable, assuming they're not having um, any symptoms. I often offer these patients... Yeah, the, I often offer patients with uh, variant carriers who don't have any phenotype but are worried. I offer them diflunosil if they don't have significant symptoms, right? It's a non-steroidal. They can take it, and it may actually prevent disease. Um, there may be some prevention trials that are coming soon, too, mm -hmm. for these particular patients. But I, Brett was mentioning, or Ahmed was, you know, the person who's 23 years old who gets their 23 and me back, and people are like, oh, they could have amyloid. The answer is no, they don't. I mean, like, that's not when amyloid shows up. Related to all this, someone asked about carpal tunnel patients. Your surgeon took out a little tissue and found it. What do you, uh, you guys do with them? Yeah. Um, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. It's a perfect corollary to, right. to the prior question. So uh, you have someone who has carpal tunnel that has tina synovium that's positive um, for, for amyloid. Congo red is positive. Uh, and let's say it's hereditary. So if it's hereditary, then I think we kind of take those a little bit more seriously. And, uh, you know, you're not supposed to have amyloid depositing in parts of your body. So um, that seems to progress a little bit faster, at least in, the, in our studies that we've done. Um, so same type of idea, right, as they're getting closer to their, their age when they may start getting it in their heart. And if it's in the carpal tunnel, then it's probably, you know, get, they're probably getting close to that age. Uh, then you want to screen them with PYP scans every so often. It's not clear how often that is, but I, my practice has been 
about every three to five years, same, and, and probably every three years if, it, if they're hereditary. Um, if they're wild type, uh, same, same concept. I mean, we're, we're scanning, we're, we're doing these, uh, these carpal tunnel biopsies only in people of a certain age, so they're not getting them if they're 20 years old or 30 years old or something like that. So uh, I've been seeing them back, you know, every one to three years, depending upon if they have other cardiac issues, and uh, scanning them with a PYP every, every few years. One bit of data that I think helps inform this is um, we published a paper with the Danish group in which they have, uh, you know, in these countries, national data sets. They took, you know, over 1,000 patients who had bilateral carpal tunnel releases. So they had them 5 to 15 years earlier. That's when the disease percolates, you know, and develops later. And so if you were a man over 70 who is not fat, <laughs> BMI was less than 30, 1 in 4 to 1 in 5 had a positive PYP. So the other question patients ask is, well, what's the chances this is going to show up? Right? And we don't know, probably the longer you live, the greater the chance, but it's probably not you know, a guarantee that you had it in your carpal tunnel. It's probably somewhere in the, I would bet, 25 or 30 percent range. And that informs the discussion about should you take diflunosol you know, every day. If you're 40, I don't want to give you diflunosol <laughs> until the time you're 70, because I think that's a lot of therapy for you know, nothing that's really manifest at this point in time. But uh, there's not a lot of good data to drive these decisions. No, in my clinical experience, almost no one with amyloid is fat, but I live in the, the Northeast. So we published data that said if your BMI is over 30, um, your negative predictive value for having amyloid was 98%, but my colleagues in the Midwest tell me I'm wrong. We have some larger patients with amyloid, <laughs> yeah. But, but your, your point is entirely right. I mean, it's, it, the, neg the, you know, the negative predictive value is high. It's, if you have someone who's very obese, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty unlikely that they have it. It's not impossible, right? But it's, it's Yeah, if they came unlikely. from Florida onto Famitis with a positive PYP scan that's a grade 2 uh, for a year for a second opinion and they weigh, you know, BMI 36, my tentacles are up and I'm getting them a repeat PYP scan and I can count them, lots of people who had, you know, false positive blood pools and were put on Famitis and didn't have disease. And that's a clinical clue. HEFPEF is an obesity, metabolic inflammatory phenotype, and this disease is, I don't know exactly why, but not associated with usually a very big weight. You know, people lose weight. Yeah. Yeah. I would want to get them, I would want to really prove that they're asymptomatic, you know, put them on a treadmill, do a six-minute walk, do NT pro BNP, you know, troponin, these types of things. Uh, really, really try to prove that they're asymptomatic. You know, I, you need to have symptoms to get to, to uh, at least the inclusion criteria in the studies, um, but I, I would really try hard to prove that they're, not, they're truly asymptomatic. If it's in the heart, I mean, we know the progression of what's happening, right? So uh, eventually they're going to get symptoms. Um, if you have a positive PYP scan and your NT pro BNP is 200 and some insurance company tells you that they can't get stabilizer, that doesn't make sense to me because we're telling everyone to find people early. So congrats to you, found them early. And we, well, we published a paper about those patients. You can cite it. Uh, it's a multinational collaboration. But over three years, those people who didn't meet the you know, BNP cutoff, they developed pretty significant worsening heart failure, need for pacemakers. Bad things happen to them. So. Um, you can probably pull that paper out, probably got to write a pre-cert or whatever you do, but, you know, you can yeah. advocate, I think. And, yeah, and if, you get, if you can get a, you know, a decline response, you, if they qualify for income-based assistance, they can get free drug from the manufacturer or sponsor, that's one. The second thing is, uh, you know, if somebody cannot get to families or afford it, we do do diflunazole or clinical trials. So I, we don't have a single patient who is not treated. For the last three and a half, four years. I mean, it depends what you decide is, you know, meaningful yield. I mean, AFib has been shown. You published not to be that great a yield, is my sense. But yeah, yeah, we looked at that and we did two stage of screening, 1.2 centimeter and 1.4 with some other, you know, richer. And it's not a great strategy for AFib only. Uh, 
the fellow was supposed to do the next step, which is AFib and heart failure and you know, uh, you know, thickness, but they decided that it's too much work. So uh, we, we didn't end up doing it, but the two phases we did, using AFib as a, as a screening strategy is not a great idea. I mean, I also think that, you know, we can't screen everybody. I mean, the fast-growing segment in the worldwide population is people over the age of 80, so I think we have to have some of these risk factors and so forth. The other thing I would just point out is I'm a little worried. PYP has a pretty low sensitivity, even in uh, the seminal studies that we published. Its sensitivity is 70%. So one thing I'm starting to get afraid of, and that's, a, that's a, in a population in which they were seen in amyloid centers and 50% had amyloid. So if a test can't find the disease when half the people had amyloid, imagine what's going to happen when you have a prevalence of 2 3 5%. PYP is not going to be the standard way I predict in five years we're making this diagnosis. We're going to have to do a little bit more MR, and we're going to have to, I think, get some better pet agents or something else, which I thought was too much money, but if we're going to spend two or three thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars on the drug, we can spend a few grand getting a, a PET scan to make sure they have the disease. Do you want to tell us what happened? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So the patient was referred to a neurologist, uh, had nerve conduction study, which did show uh, lower extremity axonal sensory polyneuropathy. Um, and so we actually were able to add silencer therapy here. So the, the, I mean, and this is like a whole another talk that could be a whole another hour, but, but uh, you know, I, the end part of this is what, is this the appropriate thing to do? You know, um, how do you differentiate between mononeuropathy from a compression entrapment type carpal tunnel versus uh, versus a more dense polyneuropathy? And a lot of questions through this. And my, I mean, I think uh, a, a mono mono uh, uh, neuropathy, you know, is, is is not a polyneuropathy, and these agents are approved for polyneuropathy. So um, I think just highlights the importance of getting them to a neurologist and getting a real expert opinion on what exactly do they have as their diagnosis. Any uh, final questions from? I'll let you go. Thank you all for attending, and we're happy to. <laughs> Sorry, I'm happy to. Yeah.